There is a lot of talk recently about narcissism, and it comes from everywhere. Whether you're in a narcissistic re relationship, narcissistic parents, narcissistic, you know, uh, colleagues, co-workers, bosses, it seems to be everywhere that we look on the internet. But most commonly, I think it is the narcissistic parent that was in our life that creates havoc on every bit and creeps in and finds us often later in life wrecking personal relationships, professional relationships, romantic relationships, causing havoc even with your own children. So what do you do when you're dealing with that parent? And what happens when that parent is actually incarcerated and doesn't even have access to you? Does it get more complicated? I'm Collier Landry. Let's get into it. Testimony continued today in the most notorious criminal trial. In when I was 12 years old, my testimony sent my father to prison for murdering my mother. I decided at an early age that our trauma should not be what defines us. It's what we choose to do with it that does. I'm here to share my unique perspective on true crime, mental health, society, and popular culture, albeit with a slight sense of humor. I'm Collier Landry, and welcome to my show. Mover Nation, what's going on? <laughs> Wherever you may be and however you may be listening or watching, thanks for making me a part of your day. Oh boy, it's good to be back, back in the studio. Here we are. Another live, and uh, there's a lot going on. If you've been following here me here on Instagram or, or on YouTube and Instagram, you've seen the progress in the studio downstairs, my interview area, which is all coming together. I hope to have it all done by the end of the month. What is, what is today? The 16th, 17th of April? I would say by the end of the month, for sure. Lots of stuff is on its way. Painting has been done. Marisol is very happy running around, and uh, she has a lot of space where she can park her little princess beds everywhere, which is where she's perched right now. But <clears throat> I wanted to bring back a fan favorite here on the YouTubes and on the podcast. Uh, that would be Letters from Prison. And I've been thinking a lot about these Letters from Prison because, as I said in the intro, there is a ton of discussion right now wherever you turn about narcissism. And I have been reading... Dr. Romani Dervasala's latest book, It's Not You. Um, <clears throat> she is probably the foremost expert on narcissism or one of the foremost experts. She has a YouTube channel here. She has a podcast called Navigating Mar Narcissism, which I have been on. I interviewed her with Tyra Newell on our Survivor Squad podcast many moons ago. And um, yeah, I, uh, I've been thinking a lot about this and the boundaries that are sort of set in your life that you try to set with people who are in your life that don't always necessarily play out the way that you want them to. But before I get into all that, I want to say thank you so much to our new patrons. We have Cat Loves Cat Skills who has joined Patreon for the year at the top level, the $20 level, the hero level. Thank you so much for your support. And also Sarah Holman, thank you so much for joining the Patreon as well. Greatly appreciate it. She came in at the $10 level. All of this helps to create the content that you guys know and love right here and put it all together. So thank you so much. And it helps keep the lights on too. Uh, so thank you, thank you, thank you. Uh, welcome, Mover Nation. Welcome to all of our wonderful Mover Nation folks out there. Uh, we're going to get into this letter from prison. This is from November the 14th. 1994. So at that time, I was, oof, what is that? That is now 30 years ago. Not quite because it was November. 30 years ago. That is wild to me. We're just saying that. Uh, I was 16 years old at this time. And I was entering this part of my life where I had a lot of questions about where I was coming from, about my father, sort of sort of, um, I don't know, trying to reconcile what happened to me as a young man. And uh, that can be very challenging. One of the things that I think is most challenging, and as you guys who have seen my film, A Murder in Mansfield, you understand that it has been a lifelong process to sort of 
not only heal myself and it's still a continual sort of thing. This is why this program was even created. Right. But also, uh, try to recognize, reconcile whether I was capable of such tendencies as well. And look for the record, I am, I am not a psychologist. I am not a lawyer. I do not work in law enforcement. I am just a guy who has been through a lot of shit and in no way, shape or form. I'm trying to diagnose my father because others have diagnosed him. So I don't need to many psychologists, including Dr. Romney, including Dr. Dennis Marikis, who is in my film, a murder in Mansfield and others have read through his information, have watched his tapes, listened to him and said, not only does he suffer from this narcissistic personality disorder, but he is actually a member of the dreaded leveling up of narcissism, what is referred to as the dark triad, which is, and something that I will get into in another video, which is Machiavellianism, psychopathy, and sociopathy. And probably those are, I think it starts with Machiavellianism, then it's sociopathy, then psychopathy, which is probably the worst because psychopaths feel nothing. And it is something that, and in my film, in the scene with my father, I actually ask him, uh, do you think you're a sociopath? Because I was under the impression most of my life that he was a sociopath because he didn't care about the outcome of anything that was going on in my life or, or the outcome of his impact in my life, right? Or his impact in other people's lives. And one of the things that Dr. Romani talks about in her book, and again, I'm, I'm not a clinical psychologist as she is. Um, however, I, um, I have definitely, uh, you know, there are certain tendencies that all these personality disorders have, right? But usually narcissists, just regular old narcissists, they, they do have at the root of their narcissism is a deep seated insecurity where they do feel shame because a lot of people talk about like your narcissist feel shame. And I almost wondered if my father felt any shame, which he didn't, uh, for many reasons. But I thought, how could you not feel shame for what you did, what you did to your family, what you did to my mother, what he did to his other children, et cetera, et cetera, his patients, his community, his own mother and family. And I thought, okay, I, I could never really quite reconcile with that until I realized that he's in that dark triad, right? Which is this psychopathy. And it is, it's a bad, bad, bad situation. But I share this content with you because I think this is informative. I know many people have dealt with narcissistic abuse in their lives and they're always trying to reconcile. And that's why a lot of you come to my content and you say, hey, what did you do? Well, I'm sharing more of that now again after diving into other subjects, but I think this is, I, I think this is all really important stuff. So this is Sunday. Again, I was 16 years old and this is my father writing to me Sunday morning, 6 November 94. Dear son Collier. Well, as anticipated, I received your last letter last night and was very thrilled to hear from you and to receive your photos. You are a very handsome young man and photograph very well. I am proud of your composure. Your mother would be very proud of you. Now, mind you, my father murdered my mother and premeditated murder at that. It was not an accident. It was not a crime of passion where some others might get confused. This was premeditated. So even the fact that he talks about uh, how your mother would be proud of you is just, it's, it's beyond. It really is beyond. Heather seems... Uh, Okay, so this person seems like a very nice girl, and I am glad that you have a decent female friend in your life, so to speak. You will have years, <clears throat> perhaps a lifetime, of meeting and making new acquaintances, and that includes female friends, but I am glad there is someone that you can socialize with. I approve of her from her photo, although I do not know her personally or her family. I'm certain that George and Susan will keep an accurate eye on that. Now, George and Susan are my adopted parents who are probably watching actually right now. Hi, guys. <laughs> I will try to answer some of your questions in your letter as best I can from the, uh, from the font of experiences that I have within myself. 
you will get straight answers from me, which I think are better for you to deal with. You will get straight answers from me, which I think are better for you to deal with. I've never gotten a straight answer out of this man ever as has been um, memorialized in the annals of film history. I think your schoolwork sounds fine to me in spite of the C in chemistry. You are now aware that you must work very hard all the time as a lost grade can swing on the final exam. I have had experiences where I lost an A by one point on an exam. So education was something that was very, that was very held in very high regard in my family. My father went to Penn as did my mother. And he, uh, look, I have, you talk about narcissists and carrying around their baggage. I have a box, a card. Oh, I have three cardboard boxes in my garage that are full of diplomas from my father's education in the glass with the glass cover in the frames and i have been carting those around for 30 plus years um and recently as i live in california <laughs> and i think keep thinking to myself well what am i going to do with these and the other day it actually occurred to me and i will definitely make a video about this uh because they're they're very heavy it's glass and metal frames and I said, I'm going to take all those out, get rid of the stupid frames, get rid of the glass and put them all in a book because they can just fit into a photo box if you, where you keep photos. And then I don't have to schlep this stuff around. It takes up so much space in the garage and all this stuff. It's ridiculous. But you think about that is a very uh, physical and tangible form of carrying around baggage. It's very representative, very symbolic to all of this this process of carrying around this baggage from dealing with a narcissist or dealing with, in my father's case, a psychopath. Anyways, education was uh, held in high regard in my family. This is a long letter. I hope I can get through it within the next few 35, 40 minutes that we have together. Uh, this is a valuable lesson for you to remember. Do not be complacent or will bite you in the ass. Stay ahead of the quote, envelope, and you should do fine and not create anxieties for yourself. Remember, anything worth it will cost you in terms of time, personal life, relationships, etc. Stop feeling sorry for yourself. Only your family will care about you. Others will just use you for their own purposes. Others will just use you for your own purposes, much like my father, who at this time, I believe, was trying to get me to uh, go along. He was trying to file an appeal to say that my mother's body was not my mother's body. And I apologize, guys. I have to just blow my nose really quickly. All right. There we go. <laughs> Tina Luffman, thank you so much for the super sticker, by the way. And, uh, Catlos Catskills, thank you also for <laughs> the super sticker saying, no more schlepping boxes. The last time I heard from my father was, well, last year. And uh, I'm still trying to track down getting in, getting his letters, by the way, because uh, they got confused in a little bit of a system error. Prison is a very complicated place to deal with, that's for sure. And if you guys watched my latest episode with my interview with Steve Fishman and Dax Devlin Ross, uh, from the podcast, The Burden, we talk a little bit about the prison system as well and how it can be very, um, well, it can be very arduous for even the most intelligent people to navigate. Um, anyways, others will use you for their own purposes, much like this man was using me at the time that he wrote this letter to me. <laughs> Stay strong and positive in whatever endeavor you choose. Be polite and aggressive at the same time. There is no need to be obnoxious about things, although you will see successful obnoxious people in your lifetime. I do not feel that it is a personal level of conduct that is acceptable to me. It was never acceptable to your mother. It should not be acceptable to you! Exclamation point. What's interesting is my father, over the years, <laughs> when people were talking, uh, would, would share stories about their interactions with my father, and this came out a lot in Murder of Mansfield, and also... 
uh, how um, he would um, uh, uh, he would tell these very outlandish. My father was a was a a malignant narcissist in a lot of ways, and a and the grandiosity to his lies were just. I mean, obviously. He murdered my mother and he dies. So, I mean, obviously that should, that should set the bar for all of us to talk about, but he would say things, he would tell stories about how he was in Vietnam. He was a Vietnam war pilot. I remember even discussing with someone one time how they remembered specifically being at a country club in Ohio and we were all at dinner and my father was telling, and these were other doctors and lawyers that we were with at the time. And he was telling a story of how he was flying his fighter jet plane in the United States Navy, an F-4 Phantom, as I believe what he said he used to fly. And his he was shot down over the South China Sea. And his, his I can't even believe I'm making this up. It sounds like Tom Cruise should be in this movie, uh, literally. And he went to pull the ejection seat lever and the cockpit would not eject. The, the, the glass would not blow off and he couldn't eject. So he went down in the airplane and in the South China Sea. And as the airplane was sinking, he used his truff, trusty, trusty Navy issued Bowie knife to cut through the glass and the metal frame, cut through and escape through the hatch in the fighter jet and swim to safety two and a half miles away on an island where he was there for 48 hours eating slugs and bark and surviving in the jungle due to his surviving training until the Navy rescue picked him up in the Vietnam War. If that sounds like a mouthful, it's because it is. And it's a mouthful of what they would refer to in Latin culture, mierda. Or what we say is bullshit. Um, <laughs> But there were these, there were these stories and these were stories that I grew up with as a child. And as a child, you kind of go through this whole, well, you know, your dad is your dad. And I, you know, I still have my father's talking about schlepping stuff. I still have my father's naval uniforms, which have also been schlepped around, which are not even real naval uniforms, to be honest with you. And I thought, oh, I might do something with them. Maybe I'll, I'll, I'll raise money for charity by selling them. Or something. I don't know, whatever I'll do. But there are these naval uniforms that he had from being an officer in the Navy, which apparently is also bullshit, right? Because this is something that I discovered much later on in life, but it apparently came out in trial that, you know, there's stolen valor is a big thing. I've talked about this before on the podcast, but stolen valor is a thing. And my father was telling everyone he was a lieutenant commander in the United States Navy. He was a fighter pilot and it was all just bullshit. And my mother, God rest her soul, I think went along with a lot of it because she was in an abusive and narcissistic relationship with a psychopath and he was very controlling. And obviously this is not new to anyone, but he was a womanizer and, uh, you know, she just kind of, you know, as you quietly, when you're dealing with someone who's narcissistic or a little off, you might just go, okay, you just kind of go with it because for fear that you might do something to anger them and then face their own retaliation that they send your way, which can also be a whole other thing. And that's a whole other discussion for a whole other day, but that would be ultimately why my mother paid the price with her life. This is, uh, you know, something that's very, you know, uh, somebody says, get rid of the uniforms. Oh yes. <laughs> oh honey, I see burning in your future. A beautiful mess says. Yeah. So anyways, there are these things that I have and uh, it's very, it's just very interesting to see the, the links that my father would go to create this facade. And again, my mother went along with it, obviously, and probably out of her own personal safety until it got to be too much. Right. So, uh, but my father had this, you know, the sense of grandiosity that comes with narcissism, this just absolute, I am the best, the best doctor ever. I mean, that was always his thing. He was always, as a child, I remember him having conversations and saying that he was the best doctor in town. And mind you, there were very well-educated Indian doctors, Chinese doctors, American doctors in our town that also had the same level of education and, and continued study he did, who were excellent doctors and specialists as well. So my father, to be uh, so pompous and arrogant to think that he was the he was the best. I mean, again, this is the this is the grandiosity that comes out of narcissism, right? 
Uh, but anyways, I digress. So he says, I agree on mommy's friends. They were never friends from the get go. It seems to me that all they did was quote, take and use your mother for their own purposes. It also seems that mommy, unfortunately was duped by them. I am glad Shelly Bowden still has contact with you. I am not at all surprised that the quote, rest of mommy's acquaintances have vanished. Fair weather friends all. Uh, and I actually just spoke to Shelly Bowden the other day and she is still in my life. And she was in the film murder in Mansfield. Uh, and she was my mother's best friend. And, um, and she has very mixed feelings about all of this and me sharing all of this. But uh, yeah, anyways, uh, November 6th, 1994. Uh, on, my, on my questions, oh, here we go. This is, this is the good, this is the good part. So I, and I remember, and there is a letter that I read in The Murder in Mansfield, which I had sent many years before this, but uh, uh, where I try to put my father's feet to the fire to get answers of, out of him on why he murdered my mother and also why did he do the things that he did why he didn't feel it necessary and again i was a child right i mean it's like an early pre-teenage teenager and if that's a thing by the way um uh, and my i would say to my father you know can't you just admit the truth so everyone everyone can get on with their lives, including him. So we all can move past it. We all can move past the, the violence, the, the destruction, all of that. And that was something that, um, that they, you know, that he just couldn't give me. So now, uh, at this time, he wants me to go before, uh, law enforcement. He wants me to, you know, I, I know he was working at this time to, for me to recant my testimony against him as well to say I made the whole thing up, even though I heard him murder my mother. And he would, uh, he would, um, he was trying to get me to get my mother's body exhumed to get a new trial. And so now he's said, he's trying to answer my questions, which he was being prevaricative and, you know, was completely avoidant of answering in the first place the year prior. On my questions about the case, I understand your desire to quote, forget things as they are painful, but I can assure you that they are just as painful, if not more to me personally. They are questions that must be asked and answered. I know the answers to some of them as the investigation has turned up many quote, interesting things. I just need to know if you are aware of them. This is the logic I am utilizing with you. On the other hand, I am glad that you have happy memories. At least I was not that bad of a father to you, eh? I know I was not a bad father, so don't, do not worry about that. I did the right thing for you and mommy all the time, and everyone knows it all too well. Sherry still complains that I did everything for mommy and you and not enough for her. Now, Sherry is my father's mistress or girlfriend who he impregnated, uh, who had my half sister 12 days before my father was arrested. That's who she is. And they were going to maintain a relationship. I believe, uh, when he was finally incarcerated for the murder and then she came to her senses, thank God, and did not choose to be, uh, did not choose to be a continual relationship with him. And I think that was probably a very wise decision. I often wonder why people try to, it's difficult. I mean, I'm not in a position. I don't know what, I mean, I know what it's like to have a loved one in prison, but it is, uh, it, you know, if you're just, you had a child with someone, but you're not married and then you try to continue that relationship and they're going to be in prison for the majority of their life. That's a life sentence for someone else. And Sherry at the time was 30, 32 at this point. Uh, that's a whole life ahead of you. And then to put that on hold. But that made my father very angry <laughs> that she did not want to be in his life. And But I most certainly don't blame her for a myriad, a myriad of reasons. On the other hand, Okay, so uh, his, so and he's talking about his Sherry complaining about how good he was to my mother and I, which is complete bullshit. And one of the things that narcissists do, and this is a great this is a great example of gaslighting, 
And if you don't know what gaslighting is, it was made famous by a movie in like the 1920s where they keep turning off the gas lamp and they say, I didn't turn the lamp off. And it's one of those things where the, the narcissist makes you feel like you're crazy. They gaslight you, say, no, that's not what's going on. And even though you know what is actually happening, right? If, you know, um, a great, ex you know, I was watching Succession. And I don't know if you guys watch Succession. I love Succession. But I remember in one of the episodes, the lead character, Logan Roy, backhands his son, Roman, in the face. And the next episode, they're riding to go, uh, they're, they're going to get on a plane to go to, uh, the UK because he's got to try to thumb screw the, his kid's mom to get, to get her to sign something to allow them to have more stock so they can you know, avoid a merger or takeover, a hostile takeover of the company. And he's sitting in the car with his son and he says, he says, uh, um, he was talking about that. He's like, are you okay? Cause the, the kid's being really quiet, right? He's like, kid, he's an adult. And he says, are you, are you oh yeah, yeah, yeah I'm, I'm fine. I'm fine. And he goes, you know, cause that thing, and he's referring to when he literally backhands him and says, F you and backhands him and don't just keep your mouth shut. And he try and he's telling him, well, you know, I, I don't think that really happened. Like I would never do that. You know that, right? This is the same thing my father is doing. He's trying to guess like I was never that bad of a father. Yeah. You were a horrible father. You were a horrible father. You were selfish. You were abusive. You are a narcissist. You were abusive to my mother and I. Like you were a terrible human being. And now you're in prison for murdering my mother. Yes, you are the you are the penultimate example of a a horrific, terrible father. Like absolutely, if you look up in Webster's dictionary and say horrible father, his photo would be in there in 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 Collier's encyclopedia, literally. And the world book, it would have his photograph. For those of you that, you know, had encyclopedias, they used to leather bound, gold, they're really expensive. Okay, now we have Wikipedia and the internet. Anyways, look, Google that. His photo will be there. So this is a prime example of gaslighting. And I know a lot of you, uh, you know, again, your father does not need to be a murderer or your, or your abusive person in your life or your narcissist does not need to be someone who tried to literally destroy it. But you can relate to the same sort of thing when the child, well, I didn't raise you that way. I never did that to you. I never, I never hit you and your brother when I was drunk. I never, I, I, I never cheated on your mother. That's, that's, that's not true. When you know it's true, when you saw him with another woman or you saw her with another man, do you know what I mean? And this is something that it, it, this type of, of abuse and this type of, of gaslighting and manipulation. Again, this is my father doing this to a feel like when I was 16 years old. And this was really fucking with my head it, it, to be honest with you. And I grew up like, well, is this, and I still, by the way, I still kind of compre, you know, I think about this a lot of times because you think about the nice times that you had and you're like, Oh, well, that didn't really happen. Did it? Oh, it did. And then you read this and, and I'm thinking to myself, Oh, did this happen? I understand. This is all something that I think so much of us, can relate to and it's because narcissistic individuals perceive themselves as the focal point of of their own ex of of, a, of the ex existence as a whole and they tend to view their children as an as an extension of that existence so there are many stuff there are many studies and there's a lot of information. I want to read you guys some of this because again, this letter, this particular, this particular statement of, uh, it is, it, it, I was not that bad of a father. I guess I was not that bad of a father. A, eh? I don't worry. I don't, I know I was not a bad father. So do not worry about that. I did the right thing for you and mommy all the time. And everyone knows it all too well. He murdered my mother. He was abusive to us. He was abusive to me, abusive to others, manipulative to others, controlling of others, putting fear. And these are the things that a narcissist does. Using fear tap tactics and manipulation to dominate. Teasing, mocking, bullying, and criticizing to maintain superiority. Something that I dealt with with my father my entire life. He used to tell me I was a little faggot. 
I used to say I was going to, my mother was turning me gay, used to throw, uh, when we would play baseball, he would throw the baseball. He tried to hit me in the head. He tried to hit me in the crotch. He was very physically abusive, striking me, hitting me, uh, pushing me down, towering over me. Like if I was playing basketball, push me in the drive, like knock me over and then tower over me. Like, you know, and I know that like, I'm not unique in this, right? This is the other young men and, and women grew up with this type of bullying and intimidation and to maintain their superiority. What over a child? Like, are you out of your mind? Engaging in gaslighting is another, is another thing, which I just showed you an example of exhibiting an intolerance of disobedience. Again, telling me and scolding me in this letter, particularly saying, do not feel sorry for yourself. Others will not care for you. I never grew up feeling sorry for myself. I don't feel sorry for myself now. I, I, I never grew up that way. I never grew up entitled. I never grew up thinking that the world owed me anything uh, because I just kind of viewed it as like, this is what, <laughs> chalk it up to the game. This is what exists. This is how this goes. Um, so uh, turning family time into an opportunity to shift attention back to themselves. Again, this is a letter to me that he's going to explain stuff. But again, he wants to sell himself as the good parent, the good father and rewrite history. Narcissists are really, really good at revisionist history. And it's absolute crazy making behavior. Another thing that they do is they always continually are moving the goalposts as well, which uh, can be very problematic on one's mental health, as I'm sure a lot of you know. By the way, I have a new trackpad on my can on my um on my computer, and I'm very excited about it, which is what I'm using. It's made this this experience right here a lot easier. And I'm also reading the letter without my glasses for the first time ever, which is also amazing. Um. Other things that they do, and you guys can know, uh, you guys know a lot of this, and since I watched Succession, only showing love when their children do exactly what they ask, withdrawing uh, withdrawing love otherwise, blaming family members when things don't go their way, their way, like it's always someone else's fault. My father would always say things of, again, here. so here he is blaming Sherry. Oh, I treated your mother and you so good, and she would complain about it you know, trying to create this whole tension there as well. Again, the mother of my sister, right? And again, a woman who has rejected him for being a psychopathic killer and being in prison for killing his wife. I mean, rightfully so, moved on with her life. And uh, these are <laughs> these are all things that these manipulators really do. And again, I know that well, maybe some of you, unfortunately, might be watching this and might go, oh, yeah, I have a narcissistic parent and they're in prison and they did X, Y to my life. And this is what happened. And they were doing the exact same behavior to me via letters and control mechanisms such as this, because you would think that once you do get them out of your life, right, that uh, that it all ends. And it doesn't because they can send letters, they send emails, they send phone, you know, phone calls, you visit them, right? Because you, as the empathic, uh, child or the empathic person in the relationship feel for them and want to comfort them. Um, and you know, they just don't show that compassion towards their children or other family members. My father is going to go on in this letter and this is going to have to be a two parter for sure. Uh, yes, I am in prison. I'm going to jump ahead a little bit. It is important for you to realize that you are a good person. You are. You have no need to hang your head in any shameful manner whatsoever. Not because of me or this case or your mother or your family. Understand? Don't let people talk you down. Don't let people talk you out of your dreams or your heritage. You are a strong and positive person with good genes. And we are all proud of you. Now, mind you. A year before, my father sent me another letter disowning me for asking him to uh, to come clean about murdering my mother. Now I'm his best friend, and now he's so proud of me, and now my whole family loves me. My entire family had disowned me, by the way. Um, yes, I am in prison. I am not in prison for a crime I committed or had anything to do with. And obviously, we know that this is complete bullshit. But again, this is gaslighting. This is, he's trying to, 
He's trying to get me to feel sorry for him because he's trying to get me to feel sorry for him because he, um, you know, he wants me to recant my testimony and say, again, you know, he's come up and he still even says it to this day. And it's, I'm sure it's part of his latest appeal action is he says that the police and law enforcement uh, and the prosecutors all convinced me that I heard my mother get murdered. The problem with that is that no one just showed up at the house randomly and then put a story in my head. I am the one who proactively contacted my mother's friends. And I'm the one that proactively said, you need to call the police. And when the police came, I'm the one that told them what happened. And I'm the one that told Detective Massmore, David Massmore, what happened and all the whole things investigation started. So the fact that uh, that he tries to has has and still continues to do so, trying to manipulate the situation of saying, well, you know, they, they planted that you were coached through your testimony at trial. You were uh, you you were. Uh, manipulated by them into saying this story. That's just not true because I'm the one that had the story because I know what happened and I witnessed what happened. And I witnessed the years and years of abuse that both my mother and I, and I, I endured at his hands. Um, yes, I'm in prison. I'm in prison for a crime I committed or I, I uh, not, not in, I am not in prison for a crime I committed or had anything to do with. I am here because I allowed my attorneys to conduct a trial in a manner, in the manner they did. I did not know about the law. It was a great big act for Mayor, Jim Mayer, who was the prosecutor, and Whitney, his, my father's defense attorney, Robert Whitney, and Henson, Judge James Henson. Uh, you must recall, there is no physical evidence against me. Uh, and my father mentions his appeals attorney, but again, you know, all this is bullshit. But again, this is what narcissists do. This is blaming, you know, they blame others when things don't go their way. So my father is convicted of something that he did, something that he did, a crime that he committed, plenty of physical evidence. And he, uh, and, but he blames everyone else's, everyone else's fault that my father is in prison in his mind. And it's still this way. To this day, you see it in my film, The Murder in Mansfield. You see his un, his his uh, his denial of the facts, his denial of these things. And again, uh, you must recall there was no physical evidence against me, as Tom Agate, who's his appeals attorney at the time, tells me the quote playing field was not level for my trial. All had their own individual motives for riding my back to a victory, and it all seems to have centered on political advancement and money. So again, this is a narcissist that's talking about being on trial for something that they did do, that they got caught, but it's the judge's fault, the prosecutor's fault, the investigator's fault, uh, his own lawyer's fault. Uh, the playing field is not level. It's politically motivated. Wait, this is 1994, not 2024. Oh, my bad. Sorry. He says again, I am innocent for crimes which I am for which I am convicted. I killed no one. I planned nothing to cause the disappearance or death of mommy, which by the way, I read these letters and it makes me cringe every time he refers to my mother as mommy, mommy, mommy. It's just, it's, it's just weird to me. Or mommy K. He used to refer to her as mommy K. That was my little nickname for her growing up. Mommy K. Um, yeah. Cringy. Um, <laughs> Anyways, uh, doesn't it seem peculiar to you? Uh, oh, oh, here we go. Sorry. Uh, he says, I am innocent of the crimes for which I am, I am convicted. I killed no one. I planned nothing to cause the disappearance or death of mommy. I don't know if it even is mommy. Again, this is cringy. This is him. And he, at the time, he's trying to get me to recant my testimony dur during his appeal and also to allow for the exhumation of my mother's body, which I did do, by the way. 
I did do. I wanted to get answers. There was an investigative journalist piece that was coming out. And I said, you know what, let's, let's do this. My, my adopted father, George took me down. We went to Akron, Ohio, home of LeBron James and the black eye and the, and the black keys. Um, we went to Akron to an FBI field office. I believe I gave blood to, uh, for them to check the DNA. Um, and that's what happened. And it was my mother. What a surprise. Um, but I, you know, again, when you're a young person and again, my father was so manipulative and controlling to me, even the, my, even though my adopted parents did their best to, uh, mitigate this manipulation, they would open these letters often and read them before I ever read them to make sure to sort of peruse them, uh, which is weird because <laughs> my father's in prison he's having his letters opened and I'm, <laughs> and I'm in an adopted home and I'm having my letters, but for good reason, they were trying to make sure that that nothing was said that was out of the ordinary or that, or so they could explain to me that this is manipulation, which at that time I did not understand even what the word manipulation meant. I didn't understand that this was being manipulative, but I remember them breaking this down for me. And I was trying to, I was a child, you know, you're trying to like, and I was a child who had just been through such a horrific scenario in my life that I also uh, wanted to literally move past all of this. And this is the last thing I really wanted to think about. I wanted to think about going to school, meeting girls, playing tennis, playing basketball, getting good grades, you know, getting a job. I was 16 at the time. I had jobs, you know. Uh, I wanted to move on with my life and try to be happy and positive and, you know, do Odyssey the Mind and, you know, track club and whatever it was that I did, rollerblading club and all those fun things growing up. Um. But it's interesting because this is the little subtle th hints. And this is this is the impact of growing up with a narcissistic parent. And again, this is gaslighting. This is manipulation. And this is all the things that I think many people who come to this content, see this content, you guys, this resonates with you. It doesn't mean that your father or your parent or was murdered or you have dealt with you know a situation with a spouse or an abusive partner who uh, may have done these things to you or gaslit you, but you recognize that the patterns are all the same. And I'm hoping that this helps anyone, you know, who as me reading it and sort of explaining it uh, openly here, the way that he, he sort of disguises and manipulates being like a good father. And let me, let me go ahead and um, let me go ahead and uh, uh, give you some life advice and and set you up for your future while really all he's trying to do is look out for himself to get me to again recant testimony to help him get out of prison because that's ultimately his goal is to not be and to not pay the price for, or, or face the consequences of his actions because it's always someone else's fault which is the entire problem with all of this is it's always someone else's fault with my father. It's always someone else's fault when you're dealing with a narcissist, or in this case, a psychopath. Someone else is to blame for their actions. Someone else is to blame for the reason why they are in the position that they are in, right? Oh, it's their fault the relationship didn't work out. It's somebody else's. Somebody else sabotaged this. Somebody else came in and manipulated you. Someone else, you listened to the wrong parent. You just, we all have recognized these patterns growing up. Uh, and it's, it is a, it, it's an epidemic for sure. So the constant exposure to a parent who distorts reality through lies and manipulation can breathe things like self-doubt and erodes a person in a child's own trust and their own feelings. Like myself, my father is doing his best to manipulate and erode the trust that I had in myself, knowing that I heard him murder my mother, right? And this, of course, is something that carries on. So what are some statistics? I want to read you guys some statistics that have come up about children who deal with narcissistic parents and grew up in narcissistic households and dealt with this type of abuse. A study by uh, J. Clinton Psychi uh, Psychiatry published in the National Library of Medicine collected data from 34,653 adults in face-to-face -face interviews and discovered that narcissistic personality disorder, NPD characteristics, were 7.7% more prevalent in men compared to 4.8% of women and overall up to 5% of people 
suffer from narcissistic personality disorder with around 75% of them being men. Regarding a lack of empathy, men scored 83.1% higher than women who scored 72.3%. They also scored higher under the sense of entitlement at 82.6%. Because remember, entitlement is a massive, massive part of narcissistic personality disorder and narcissism. And exploitation at 65.5% compared to women who scored 77.1% and 55.7%. However, under the character trait of, quote, envy, women scored higher at 78.4% compared to men at 72.6% and arrogance was at 42% while men scored at 35.7%. That's a pretty big, this is a pretty big uh, group, you know, 34,000 people these, these guys research through. Research also shows that narcissism is more common among young adults between the ages of 20 to 34. And when it comes to following the, to the to the following traits, they scored significantly higher than older adults. Fantasies of ideal love, unlimited power and success, 78.2% versus older adults at 49.8%. Exploitation, 67.7% versus 55%. I'm going to take away the decimals. There are also statistically more single narcissists, 9.6% followed by 7% of divorced and separ or separated, and only 5% are married. I wonder why. <laughs> statistically, individuals who suffer from narcissistic personality disorder are more likely to suffer from anger management issues and feelings of hatred and more likely to engage in abusive behavior towards their partners. Among incarcerated Individuals, 21% have a diagnosis of NPD with only 18.5% who have antisocial, antisocial personality disorder and 14.2% who have paranoid personality disorder. It's quite common that individuals who suffer from NPD end up having problems with substance usage or substance use disorders. Um, narcissists often, f often use drugs or alcohol to cope with their overwhelming emotions, frustration, and anxiety that comes with this mental health issue. Statistics show that 14% of people with NPD end up developing an alcohol use disorder and 24% of people with NPD, uh, with NPD abuse other types of narcotics and drugs. People who suffer from narcissistic personality disorder rarely seek treatment, and this is due to their perception of their own self-image as they see themselves as special, unique, and above the standard. Their fragile ego is unable to accept any flaws or imperfections and thus inflates their own self-image to improve their own self-esteem. Moreover, they project their imperfections on others and blame others for everything that goes wrong. Yes, I am in prison. I am not in prison for a crime I committed or had anything to do with. I am here because I allowed my attorneys to conduct a trial in the manner they did, and I did not know about the law. <laughs> you must recall there is no evidence against me. Uh, the, my attorney says the playing field was not level for my trial. All had their own individual motives for riding my back to a victory. And it all seems to have centered on political advancement and money. I am innocent of the crimes for which I am convicted. I killed no one. I plan nothing to cause the disappearance or death of mommy. I don't even know if that is mommy. If that doesn't sum it up, I don't know what does. It's an epidemic. Now, I know a lot of you come to this material again. It resonates with you. Unfortunately, it resonates with you because you've been through challenging circumstances or yourself. So please, if you wouldn't mind, drop a comment below if you feel so inclined. Let us know what you're going through. If you want to share with our community, we are a very loving and open community. Move, Mover Nation is here. Uh, you can comment here in the chat. I'm going to go through the chat here in a second. Uh, but please drop a comment. Let me know what you think of this video uh, and, and share your story. If you, feel, if you feel so bold and you feel so brave, we are here to support you in that. Uh, Mover Nation is a safe place. Uh, let's go through some of the comments here. Uh, a lot of people, oh my God, he's still treating you like a child. 
thank you all so much for uh all my moderators and thank you so much um for uh everyone promoting and sharing and yes cat loves cat skills george and susan are good people yes they are wonderful people and uh thank god for them indeed uh i have missed you guys i seem to keep missing the lives no we have not had lives lately because i am redoing the channel as you see we have new thumbnails we have a new look that's coming up the content is shifting uh we're getting away from doing so much true crime and more about my story and more about talking about things like mental health narcissism gaslighting things that i think are really important by the way and sharing my own personal experience because it resonates with so many of you you have spoken i have listened mover nation we have if you are a channel member or a patreon subscriber we have this coming weekend uh sunday april 21st is our collier's av club second installment of collier's av club where we will be watching the tinder swindler and links will be sent to that probably in the next 24 hours uh that will be on sunday april 21st at 8 p.m eastern 5 p.m pacific i'm marking my calendar down so i don't forget either for some reason my calendar hasn't been giving me alerts but please uh join us if you are a member of the channel at the thriver level and above you are a member of the av club we're going to do one more round allowing everybody to join and uh also probably the following weekend we're gonna do another screening of my film a murder of mansfield as well for as part of collier's av club so come on come all it's a really great fantastic experience we all get to share and watch everything uh tinder swindler is on netflix so you do need to have a netflix subscription i'm saying that because that's what i'm supposed to say and then we can all watch it together if that makes sense uh mover nation we get through another one and guess what as i've been hard at work we have a new intro and a new outro for the show. Mover Nation, thank you so much for watching. Thank you so much to all my channel members and Patreon supporters. And for more exclusive content, behind the scenes videos, monthly VIP meet and greets and watch parties, please consider supporting me on Patreon or by becoming a YouTube channel member. If you like this video, check out this one right here or this one right here. And don't forget to like and subscribe because it helps with the algorithm. On that note, I'm Collier Landry. I'll see you on the next one. Good girl, Marisol. Good girl. <laughs>